Western Princess of Wales, there was a real African welcome as they stepped into the heat of Lagos Airport. It was an enthusiastic and rhythmic start to their visit to Nigeria and neighbouring Cameroon. The royal couple watched from the side of the runway. Then, as the dancers gave a final flurry, the official convoy set off. The tour was underway. And so the royal couple is safely on Nigerian soil and are now being driven into the centre of Lagos. It's the first time that the princess has been here in Africa, but judging by what we've seen here today, it's going to be a tour full of custom and colour. But even by royal standards, it's going to be a tough one. They've got to pack in more than 40 engagements. The first, a meeting with the country's military leader, President Babandiga at State House. It's also one of the hottest times of the year, making travelling an exhausting business. The princess in particular suffers from the heat, but no problems here posing for photos in the cool government corridors. <laughs> Courtesy call made, it was on to Britannia, which was to be their base for much of the tour. There was just time for a quick change before a stylish return to State House for a banquet. The princess, every inch elegant in silk chiffon. <laughs> These are difficult times for Nigeria's leader. His country is politically divided and is badly in debt. The prince, though, was staying well away from politics. One of the enormous advantages of visiting Nigeria is that after six hours flying from London, there is only a one-hour time change, which means that we don't actually have to have dinner at two o'clock in the morning. And this is Lagos, a city that slumped after a brief oil boom. Hot and congested, a mass of cars and people with a thick mixture of street dust and car fumes clogging up the air. According to one guidebook, the way to enjoy Nigeria is to avoid Lagos. Though to do so would be to miss out on the sights and sounds of this colourful city. But there's a side of Lagos that the royal couple won't be seeing, the city's shanty towns with their open sewers. Water is precious here, but in some areas, collecting it still remains a primitive affair. People do their best in the circumstances, although with large families, it's difficult. But the royal couple did see for themselves the country's medical problems in a tour of the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, where they met the doctors who were treating both old diseases like TB and new ones like AIDS. Here, infant mortality is high. 10% of Nigerian children die before they're five. In the countryside, that figure can double. The princess, thinking perhaps of her own two children, was clearly touched by what she saw. Nigeria is the second biggest recipient of British aid, and the princess handed over a baby incubator to the hospital, although by now she was clearly beginning to feel the heat. Outside, the crowds waited excitedly for a glimpse of their royal visitors. Eventually, they appeared, and as they walked through the hospital grounds, hundreds of hands reached out. For one medical student, the commotion was well worthwhile. Princess Diana came up to us and she smiled at us, and I told her that I thought she was beautiful. Then she shook my hand. I was really excited. How did you feel when that happened? I felt great. I felt really excited, because I think she's very nice. I think she's very, very pretty. And which hand was it? This one. I'm not going to wash it <laughs> today. <laughs> the princess's first official engagement on her own was at a fair for women, organized by the president's wife. For nearly an hour, she sat watching the dancers with little protection from the baking sun.
Setting the tone for the tour, the princess appeared relaxed and confident. Watched closely by women in the audience, the princess was shown local handicrafts, some looking as if they'd be more at home in a courtroom than an African village. Women in the country are being encouraged to produce more local village goods, and the princess met the little girls who must learn these traditional skills from their mothers. And then the unthinkable happened. The Princess of Wales looked almost plain in comparison to her colourfully dressed hosts. Together again, the royal couple left the bustle of the city and headed out into the bush to a small Nigerian village, their cavalcade sweeping past the palm trees and mud huts. Dressed in a cool, patterned pink dress, the princess experienced the colours and singing of village life. No labour-saving devices in this village. Here, it's all done by hand, from pounding the cassava to mixing the palm oil. The princess found out that in Nigerian villages, it's the women who do much of the work. Here, a man is judged on the number of children he has. Prince Charles, dressed in a safari suit, asked one lady the size of her family. Well, the prince tried to work out their ages. It was time to go, and the large royal party strode through the dusty village streets. The Nigerian flag flies over Inugu's government house, but this building stands in what was briefly Biafra, the state bitterly fought over two decades ago. Now more peaceful days, and inside, a table was being set for a princess. In the banqueting hall, everything was ready. The English wine had been flown in from Kent. The rest, though, was definitely a local affair. Food is always a talking point on a royal tour. You never quite know what you're going to end up with. At the state banquet, the menu featured grilled ram, coated yam and boiled plantain. But at this state lunch at Government House in Inugu, the royal couple will tuck into a plate of catfish. There were royal pastry swans, and to finish, an elaborately iced cake flavoured with local fruit. Outside, a familiar tune in an unfamiliar place. A touch of tartan to pipe the royal visitors in to lunch. After the meal, their hosts brought out a large wooden present. Two men could hardly lift it, and an amused princess finally realized. It's a mirror. Princess Diana worked hard at trying to keep a straight face. In the northern part of Nigeria, the prince and princess called on the state king, known as the Shehu. The princess met one of his many wives and was congratulated on having such a young husband. Outside in Maiduguri, growing excitement as the warriors of the north started to arrive for the Durbar. Some had brought their horses hundreds of miles to take part in this rare and spectacular show of force. As the local chiefs marshaled their troops on the parade ground, the side streets were filled with horsemen preparing to take part. Days had been spent decorating both riders and animals. 
It seemed as if most of the town had turned out to watch, some with better vantage points than others. At a special podium in front of the Shehu's palace, the royal guests arrived to take their seats for the biggest durbar Maiduguri has ever seen. The Shehu, under a gold umbrella, led the procession, followed by line after line of chiefs and warriors, all of them bearing down on the podium. As he joined the royal couple, the Shehu ignored the princess. Another reminder that in northern Nigeria, it's a man's world. One by one, the other chiefs came forward to pledge their allegiance. And after the chiefs came the warriors. For Princess Diana, just watching was thirsty work. Down below, out of view of the royal couple, the police were beating back the crowds. And still they kept on coming, each tribe with its own distinctive flags and costumes. The prince seemed fascinated by it all. But after two hours, the princess had seen enough. Away from the festivities and the Malai Hospital for Victims of Leprosy. In Nigeria, two in every thousand are affected. Leprosy is curable, but in village communities, the fear and stigma still remains. Sometimes whole families are cast out. Just before the royals arrived, I spoke to a young English volunteer at the clinic, Dr. Kate Dawson. The main benefit that we're going to see from having the Prince and Princess of Wales coming to the hospital is to show people that leprosy is not a frightening and terrible disease, but that it can be cured and people can go back to live normal lives. It will encourage people to come for treatment and we can interrupt the transmission of the disease. As the visit began, people crowded round the windows. Inside the wards, Dr. Dawson explained to the royal couple about the patients they were going to meet. The princess saw how this man lost fingers and a whole foot before the disease was arrested. Despite their handicaps, patients are encouraged to develop suitable skills. But while he's been here, he's encouraged him to carry on with his business, and he's also done extremely well. I think he's done Later, they were taken outside to a village where sufferers are shown how they can fit back into the community. They spoke to many of the victims, and as they left, it was clear that the royal visit had done much to cheer everyone up. The last event in Nigeria was a canoe regatta at Port Harcourt docks with an acrobatic policeman as a warm-up act. People had come from miles around for this, the Nigerian equivalent of Henley. Held only on high days and holidays, it was definitely the social event to be seen at. While the royal couple got themselves settled in to watch the boats go past in the regatta, I asked a Nigerian government official, Mrs. Bene Abe, whether the couple had lived up to expectations. I think so, because uh, they've read quite a bit about, about the couple. We, as soon as we knew that the couple we were going to visit, there were a lot of write-ups about them. And um, I think they, they lived up to the expectation. They're a young couple, and... Um, very, very pretty girl she is, and um, so far so good, I think. Everything has gone marvelously well. 34 years on and little had changed. There were new generations of chiefs and warriors, but their transport was the same. By now, the princess was really picking up the holiday mood. And so, on a sunny and energetic note, the Nigerian part of their tour came to an end.